In my 6 plus years of games criticism, one of the most common questions I've asked myself is which difficulty is best for critiquing a game. Even when playing a game for personal enjoyment, the question still pops up. Which difficulty is the right one? It's an interesting question, and one that has multiple angles from which it can be viewed. And as someone who's also started learning game development, it's something I'm sure will cause a dilemma in the future. Because ultimately, the decision of difficulty comes down to the intent of the player and that of the designer. That said, I've also been motivated by a few comments mentioning flaws in my critiques of games, saying that I played on the wrong difficulty or that I didn't get the full experience on the difficulty that I played. I'm sure those comments were mostly from enthusiastic fans, and I haven't seen any with true malice behind them, but I thought it would be a good idea to elaborate on how I choose which difficulty to play, and figured I'd delve further into the concept as a whole. I've narrowed this idea down to three categories, developers, players, and reviewers, each one with a different goal in mind when booting up a game. Developers want to strike a balance that makes the game challenging without becoming frustrating, players want entertainment, and reviewers want to examine and dissect a game's appeal. With that, let's take a more in-depth look at the subject, starting with how these choices are presented before moving into how they're made. The first choice most players make when booting up a game for the first time is deciding their difficulty, something that rarely changes over the course of a playthrough. While some may switch when things get too tough or too easy, many won't either out of pride or fear of missing out on a feeling of satisfaction or a difficulty-related achievement. It can also feel like admitting defeat, meaning when the game is finished you lose some of that sense of accomplishment. As such, the industry standard for quite some time has been twofold. Either choose between variations of easy, medium, hard, and possibly some bonus difficulties, or to skip the process altogether and aim for a universal experience. Each approach has its own benefits and downsides. Series like Mario, Zelda, and Dark Souls forgo difficulty levels altogether. This gives the developers free reign to design the game experience as they see fit without needing to worry about balancing for every single difficulty option. This also allows for more development time to be spent on fleshing out the game itself, rather than tweaking certain details for these other modes. This benefit is best seen in puzzle games, where the need to create different puzzle difficulties could easily double or triple the work of the designers. There are games that attempt to achieve this without recreating the puzzles from scratch like Danganronpa and Resident Evil, but these typically opt for reducing hints or increasing options rather than completely recreating their puzzles to increase complexity. And while foregoing difficulty options may seem lazy, it's just as much a design choice as it is a cost-effective one. For starters, when playing this kind of game, every player knows they're getting the full experience. There's never the question of, is this game too easy or did I choose the wrong difficulty? It's always tailor-made. Plus, the more focused design allows developers to avoid potential tedium by fine-tuning the length of an encounter to fit the desired pace. However, there are some clear downsides to this approach as well. Players that get stuck at a certain point may get discouraged and quit altogether, leaving them with a negative view of the game as a whole. Others may find the experience trivial and feel they've wasted their time. There are ways to avoid this as we'll discuss later, but first let's take a quick look at games that do have difficulty options. This is the standard for many games, easy, medium, and hard. However, many modern games have taken to elaborating on these options, usually with the easiest difficulty being offered to players interested in the story, medium being for players who want the occasional challenge, and hard being for those who either have experience with the genre or just want a more significant challenge. There are usually harder modes as well, but those are typically reserved for secondary playthroughs and those who truly love the game and want to master its mechanics. This is a fantastic shift in the gaming industry, since players are better equipped to choose the best difficulty option for the experience that they want to have. If they get stuck, there's no brick wall and they can simply lower the difficulty to progress. Perhaps most importantly, these variations also give players a new experience when playing through the game for a second time, increasing replayability. However, while those are all great, they also come with the exact downsides one might expect pretty much the opposite of the benefits to skipping the options altogether. Players on lower difficulties may lose some of that satisfaction gained from finishing since they didn't achieve as much as the others. Some may have chosen the wrong difficulty for their skill level, either due to under slash overestimating themselves or a poor explanation of the options, and have a lesser experience as a result. However, the most common issue with difficulty levels comes in the form of bullet sponges and other similar enemies. 
Since most developers don't have the time to redesign their game over and over, or even tweak the AI, many opt for the laziest approach to difficulty adjustment, modifying player damage, enemy count, and enemy health. This can lead to many encounters being poorly paced, unfair, overly long, and worst of all, boring. For example, giving an enemy with easily avoidable attacks a double-sized health bar doesn't make the fight harder, it just makes the fight twice as long. So what are the best ways to avoid the issues present with each approach? Well, typically it's to introduce the elements that are missing with the chosen option. Without difficulties, the player lacks choice, so what many games do is introduce choices within the game itself on how to progress. In most Mario games, players get to choose which objectives to complete in order to reach the end. Dedicated players may choose to 100% the game, but to finish, it's usually up to them. The Witness also takes this approach, with only 7 out of the game's 11 main areas being required to finish the game. Even in the Soul series, players have the ability to grind for levels, which may be tedious, but presents an option to make things easier before moving on, something present in most other RPGs as well. This, more or less, adds a difficulty option to the game. The difference is that rather than being an extrinsic difficulty in which the game's mechanics change, it's the player's intrinsic motivation that allows them to control the difficulty through gameplay. The balance can be difficult to achieve due to the stubbornness of some and impatience of others, but the general goal is to always allow players with enough skill to progress while giving other players options, ideally options that improve their skill level as their player character becomes more powerful. On the other hand, games that include difficulty options can lack fine-tuning. This can be fixed in a variety of ways. Many games forego the easier option of adjusting enemy health in exchange for improving their AI as the difficulty increases. This is a lot more work, but when done correctly, it can really assist with keeping players on their toes during repeat playthroughs. Another approach is to limit a player's options. Adding new enemies that prevent players from taking certain actions such as the shield carriers in Spider-Man forces the player to think more critically about the encounter before proceeding. Many survival games take a similar approach by reducing supplies found in the environment, both forcing players to make tougher choices regarding their item usage and encouraging them to seek out danger in the hopes of finding more tools for the future. Speaking of which, there are also games like The Last of Us, where harder difficulties remove features from the game that make the experience more challenging. This can be tricky to do without making the player feel cheated out of a part of the experience, but when done correctly, a harder difficulty setting can almost give the player an entirely new experience. The worst of it all tends to occur in the mobile gaming space, games in which progression is blocked due to arbitrary difficulty spikes that can't be reasonably overcome without paying for upgrades, power-ups, increased levels, etc. I won't be going in-depth about this, since anyone who plays these games knows that it's less about fun and entirely about profit, but I felt that it's worth mentioning since even some AAA games have taken to these predatory practices over the years, particularly in the online multiplayer space. So it's worth mentioning and keeping in mind that when money's involved, the publisher likely doesn't consider player enjoyment to be the top priority. In the end, there is no universal best option for difficulty settings, would Bloodborne be just as great if it had an easy story mode in addition to the existing difficulty? Absolutely, the world is beautiful and a delight to just explore. Does the hard mode in some sandbox open world games make traversal a bit tedious from time to time? Occasionally. But much like with every other aspect of game development, the most important question isn't which option is best, but whether the developers have the time to ensure that the option chosen is utilized to its fullest potential. Gamers are extremely passionate, so it makes sense that they push themselves to their absolute limits out of love for their favorite games. Speedrunners breaking games in every way imaginable to push past boundary after boundary is a spectacle to behold. Players beating the hardest games in the world using DK bongos, Dance Dance Revolution pads, or even fruit hooked up to a circuit board make for incredible accomplishments. Some even go the full masochist route and try to complete an entire series without taking a single hit. Their love for these games and the medium as a whole is infectious, but it can also breed a lot of elitism and toxicity. It seems like any time a new entry in a series is deemed to be even slightly easier than its predecessor, the developers face some sort of backlash. This can even extend to the addition of accessibility options if they could make the game easier for non-disabled players as well. 
Hell, have you ever asked a FromSoft fan about the addition of an easy mode? It's ridiculous. It makes the other fans look bad. Similarly, older gamers will often mock those who use save states or rewind features on emulators for classic games because it takes away from the challenge of those older games, and to them, it's cheating. It kind of is, but in reality, most NES games were designed to be unfair in order to extend their length, not increase their challenge. Using advanced features as makeshift checkpoints may make the game easier, but it also improves the pacing and reduces repetition, making the experience better as a whole. The reason I bring this up isn't to bash the gaming community as a whole or to say their concerns are invalid, but rather to show both the positives and negatives of players looking to conquer the next great challenge. The problem is that this desire shouldn't be extrinsically motivated. Players shouldn't push themselves into madness for validation or a feeling of superiority, but rather for their own sense of accomplishment or to better themselves. The addition of an easy mode doesn't take away from a game any more than the addition of an impossibly difficult mode. When discussing games with others, I'll occasionally hear that a game was too easy or too hard for them to get invested. My old roommate constantly says she's awful at games and didn't get into them as a kid because of it, when in reality, the opposite is true. The fact of the matter is that everyone has to learn to play at some point, and anything that makes that process more approachable is going to make the community and industry grow as a result. Without easier experiences, new players are discouraged from the process of learning. Like how guitarists can be discouraged if they start out trying to play Clapton, or home cooks start by trying to sear the perfect steak. With all of that having been said, there is certainly merit to including a singular difficulty in a game. It can push players into new experiences that they may not have attempted otherwise and may enjoy more than they had expected. Pushing a player to go beyond their limits is one of the most powerful and rewarding tools at a developer's disposal. However, this feeling can certainly be retained without sacrificing easier difficulty options. The best way would be to increase the skill gap between difficulties. Finishing, completing, and speedrunning Super Mario 64 are completely different experiences, but they can all be fun in their own right. By splitting the difficulties into Story Mode, Standard Mode, and Nightmare Mode, every kind of player is accommodated, but those looking for the challenge that will put their skills to the maximum test can still be satisfied in their achievement. Not to mention, video games can be many things. They can be a challenge that give players a sense of satisfaction, but also a new world to experience through exploration, a moving and relatable story, an escape from the outside world, or a toy used to express their creativity. But above all else, they're meant to entertain. And that's what it's all about. The most important goal to keep in mind when choosing a game or difficulty setting is how best to enhance the entertainment value you can get out of the experience, and no one should ever be shamed for enjoying a game in a way that brings them joy so long as it doesn't take away from the fun of others. If you play piano and you have more fun playing pop songs than classical pieces, it doesn't make you any less of a piano player or mean that your experience is lesser than that of others. Same goes for someone playing pickup basketball with friends instead of running endless drills to be a better shot. The reward is in the experience you've had, and what's important is choosing to pursue what makes you happiest above all else. Lastly, it's important to examine how this unique element of video games as an art form makes games criticism different from that of any other medium. When evaluating an album, painting, film, etc., there's only one piece to critique. Though different reviewers may weigh certain elements of the product more heavily than others and may have different interpretations based on their life experiences, the subject of discussion itself doesn't change. Video games throw a wrench into that framework. When difficulty options exist, players may not know which option the reviewer is covering, and even if they do, there's no guarantee players reading the review will play at the same difficulty. Even without options, different reviewers have their own level of skill and their own tolerance for potential frustration or tedious level grinding, making the subject of difficulty somewhat subjective. Of course, there are other factors that can make each player's game experience different, such as choosing different classes, story options, or preferred weapon set, just to name a few. This only increases the amount of subjectivity, since a player using a range build versus a mage build versus a melee build in games like Elder Scrolls and Dark Souls can have vastly different experiences, and as such, reviewers should always mention the options chosen when they can. 
Even deciding between sprinting through the story, tackling some side quests, or completing the game can impact the difficulty curve immensely. Hell, when I played Fallout 3 for the first time back in high school, I thought the game was ridiculously easy despite loving it. I loved exploring the environments and worlds, but felt the game lacked any kind of challenge. It turns out that I missed the prompt explaining fast travel and spent over 300 hours of playtime walking everywhere and gaining experience on my travels that other players skipped over, meaning I was overleveled for the entire playtime. It just goes to show that the path you take can drastically change your gaming experience. Now the obvious solution is for reviewers to play through a game on every difficulty setting and with each type of playstyle, but that's clearly unrealistic. So how does a critic comment on the difficulty of a game in their evaluation? Short answer, they don't. While a critic should be inclined to share their subjective view of a game's difficulty, the more important aspect to focus on is whether that difficulty is implemented fairly and in a way that keeps the gameplay enjoyable. Some good examples include a tutorial properly explaining a game's mechanics, glitches or random events causing unfair and inconsistent difficulty spikes, or failure killing the player's pace rather than just giving them a minor inconvenience. In older NES games, losing all of your lives can reset the level or even the entire game, forcing players to constantly replay long sections of a game that they've already passed through just to get back to where they left off. This kind of design has become outdated because it makes a game more tedious to play. When placed next to a game like Cuphead, the bosses may have similar difficulty levels, but one is integrated into the game's design much better since players can immediately restart a boss fight upon death. This is also why after Demon's Souls, From Software became much more merciful with the checkpoints. The difficulty is generally consistent, but the repetition is lessened significantly. These are the types of critiques that are actually useful to those looking for information on a game, because while they might have a different perspective on the moment-to-moment -moment struggles, they'll at least understand whether or not their struggles are due to their own faults, and whether they're worth the effort to overcome. Personally, I have a few rules as a reviewer that I apply to my reviews and retrospectives. 1. If a game has numerous difficulty options simply labeled easy, medium, and hard, or some variation of such, I will always choose medium. Even if there are five extra difficulties past hard, the words medium or normal imply that the developers intend for this to be the default. As such, that's likely the difficulty most gamers will select on their first run through. The same applies if there are descriptions stating that a certain difficulty is the intended choice. To me, that signals that the game was designed around these settings and will be at its best when played that way. However, if a game instead describes its options as they correlate to a player's personal experience, I'll play on the difficulty that best fits my own. With most games, this means I'll choose the options suggested for those with more exposure to the genre in question. Doing this may put me on a harder mode to start, but will have me playing at a similar level relative to my skill as the average player. Number 3. Consistency I will not change the difficulty throughout a playthrough unless I'm testing out a feature specific to that setting, such as with Grounded Mode in The Last of Us. And as one might expect, I play every game in a series at the same difficulty as well. This keeps the challenge consistent and critique fair. Plus, while my interpretation of a game's challenge may be subjective, I can at least state whether certain games are easier or harder relative to others in the same series. Number 4, I can look up a walkthrough or guide, but only as a last resort if I get stuck for an extended period of time. How much time depends on the game at hand. However, if I do so, I have to mention it in the critique, and then go on to explain whether the game was at fault through unfair mechanics or being unclear, like when giving Jabu Jabu a fish to access a dungeon in Ocarina of Time, or if I simply missed something and needed to increase my skill level such as with some boss strategies in Cuphead and Bloodborne. And number 5, I can use save states in an emulator, but I have to give it a few tries first. And I have to beat bosses and levels as intended. No save stating between hits. As stated earlier, this is less about difficulty and more about pacing and reducing repetition. Of course, there can be exceptions to these rules, but the general idea is to try and inform players on the design of the game itself as best I can. I've received a lot of comments on my Jack 2 retrospective telling me that the game isn't actually difficult and that I was playing it wrong, and I didn't actually have that much difficulty with the game. 
My complaint wasn't that the game was hard, but rather that it had some massive difficulty spikes out of nowhere, leading to an inconsistent experience, randomized NPCs making some quests literally impossible to complete in certain scenarios by blocking a path necessary to finish a mission, a majority of ranged enemies discouraging melee combat, and a spinning jump shot that made many encounters easily completed, though tedious and repetitive. So when I criticize Jack 2, I also follow that up with specific examples of the game's design that pushes players into playing a certain way. When I mentioned Chains of Olympus being an easy entry in the God of War series, I noted that it was due in part to the overabundance of checkpoints and healing chests in addition to the actual combat encounters, but also mentioned that this is almost necessary in a portable title. There's also the matter of a critic's personal experience and skill level. Some have said that a person shouldn't review a game in a genre they're unfamiliar with, and I couldn't disagree more. What's important is that a reviewer notes if they lack experience in the type of game they're reviewing. That kind of coverage has immense value to others who might be new to the genre, not just in terms of difficulty, but in understanding who the game might appeal to. Of course, they should always try to consider who a game is made for when drawing conclusions or presenting a final score, but in terms of giving players an idea of what to expect, reviewers new to a genre offer a valuable perspective that veterans simply can't provide. While playing a game at different difficulties may change a player's experience, ideally the praise and criticism should generally hold true regardless of difficulty. And if not, the goal of a reviewer should be to make the player aware of what causes a game to be more or less fun based on the player's preferences and the choices made during gameplay. That's where this video was going to end. I plan to sum up my main points, tell everyone to subscribe, and let you go on with your day. Then, in the middle of editing, I found this video. In it, Ratatasker argues that certain games shouldn't have an easy mode as it can be detrimental to the game itself. I vehemently disagree and intend to counter any points made in his video here. You don't need to see it to understand what I'm about to say since I'll give context, and I can't honestly recommend watching since the creator spends 25 minutes going over random unrelated subjects in an attempt to back up his point before loosely cobbling together a thesis, but if you want some additional context, I'll have a link to the video in the description below. The core of Ratatosker's video can be summed up in two statements. The first is that games are the product of a development team's vision, and they have every right to deny players of an easy mode. As I said before, games without a difficulty slider aren't necessarily incomplete. As a reviewer, I wouldn't dock a game points for lacking adjustable difficulties. This is because players know what they'll get when they grab a game, and if they don't, they can easily find out. In this sense, buying a game is like ordering food at a restaurant. If the menu says an item contains cheese, you can't really be upset if they choose not to have vegan or lactose-free options. But having those options doesn't take the cheese away from anyone else. Likewise, even with an easy mode, the intended gaming experience would still be there, and some developers go out of their way to point that out, much like how the menu description of a meal would be at a restaurant. It doesn't mean players who choose another difficulty have done a disservice to the developer, it just means they have their own preference, and that's perfectly valid. So while I agree that developers have the right to forego this option, that doesn't mean they should. There's also a flaw in the assumption that it's always best when developers have the final say in the experience their game provides, but developers can be wrong. Sometimes that comes in the form of poor design decisions, but some players also perform challenge runs in games like Pokemon or Dark Souls, playing the game as they see fit in spite of the developer's intentions. Being an interactive medium, player freedom and developer intention should both be respected, but at the end of the day, player enjoyment is the top priority as long as it doesn't lessen the experience for others. Which brings us to the video's second major point, that the addition of an easy mode does, in fact, affect the playing experience even for those who don't intend to choose it. This argument is absolutely ludicrous, and the video itself doesn't even attempt to validate the assertion. The three reasons he gives in this part of the video are that players who choose to play on easy may underestimate their skills and choose not to challenge themselves, that they lose the sense of community from shared struggles, and that having the option to switch to an easy mode changes the way a game feels. 
The first two arguments don't support his point at all, since they're about how they affect those who do choose the easier difficulty, not those who don't, and the third point can be nullified by preventing the player from switching difficulties mid-playthrough. Now, look, I don't hate this creator or wish him any ill will. I strongly disagree with him, but that doesn't have any reflection on him as a person. In fact, I chose his video specifically because I saw it as the culmination of all non-toxic arguments against an easy mode. These are the same arguments made by many who aren't elitist or pompous, just incorrect and misguided. One of the main ideas prevalent in these arguments is that players who went through a difficult game may have chosen the easy mode if it was presented as an option and missed out on certain experiences. However, I'd posit three points. First, that nearly all players who would have chosen an easy mode if it existed likely would have either avoided the game entirely or given up after playing for a short time and wasting their money. You can't deprive someone of an experience they wouldn't have had in the first place. Second, most games brought up in these arguments do have a way to make the game ridiculously easy, even if it takes a long time. So really, all an easy mode does is speed up that process. For example, in pretty much every Souls game, players could theoretically farm souls in the opening areas to reach max level before ever stepping foot outside, thereby making themselves a god when compared to the enemies around them. Alternatively, they could look up a walkthrough on how to get overpowered early on, or exploit glitches in the game's code, all of which are perfectly valid, so an easy mode would just be the developer's way of acknowledging those intentions without forcing the player to waste their time in order to play the way they want. Lastly, an easy mode doesn't have to be the same experience as the main game. It can simply offer an alternative way to play to experience a game's world, lore, and story without needing to spend the time practicing, which many people don't have. And if you think a game like Elden Ring doesn't have any value outside of its difficulty, that's just an insult to all of the developers who worked their asses off crafting an incredible world for players to lose themselves in. Plus, you clearly aren't aware of the mountains of lore videos on YouTube. I'm not saying that an easy mode has to be a mandatory feature in all games. Not every game needs to be made for everyone. But unlike the addition of a shitty driving section in a shooter or first-person platforming in a puzzle game, an easy mode has no negative effect on the game itself. Plenty of games have had additional features that aren't part of the main experience and are only used by a small subset of the player base, like audio tests, concept art, and even entire challenge and multiplayer modes in games like God of War and Doom. Not to mention with all of this talk about developer intention and not messing with their vision, people sure do seem to like mods. In fact, looking at another Ratatusker video in which he cheers the fact that Souls games will never have an easy mode, it's kind of funny when you consider the fact that they already do, even if it's not official. Does the existence of that mod make the game worse for those who don't install it? Of course not. So what's the difference between that and just having the option in the actual game? I also have one question for those out there who think Elden Ring is only good if it's difficult. Did you look up a walkthrough while playing? Seriously, did you at any point go into the wiki to find the locations of smithing stones or the weaknesses of certain bosses or how to progress Ronnie's quest? Because if so, you played the game on easy mode. Figuring out how to progress is part of the challenge in Elden Ring. So unlike someone who used spirit summons or summoned other players to help out with certain fights, who can replay the game without doing those things and still have the challenge that you had, you can never play the game as intended. You'll always be someone who played the game on easy mode, and short of getting a head injury that forces you to forget what you know, you'll always be someone who took the easy way out. So just think about that next time you're considering raining on someone else's parade. That aside, I feel like a lot of arguments in favor of easy modes fall back on the idea of accessibility, but I don't want to use that as a crutch, because, really, more difficulty options are a good thing regardless, especially for those who love gaming but might not have the time to get good or find enjoyment in butting their head against a wall. Going back to the restaurant metaphor, if something is brought to the table for free that you don't want to eat, it's rude to whine about it especially when it may be the only thing someone else at the table would try. In the end, it's just about entertainment. 
Developers want to find a balance that prevents players from getting overly bored or frustrated, players should choose whichever difficulty makes them happiest, and reviewers should cover games in a way that best informs players on how much enjoyment they're likely to get out of a product based on the player's preferences, while also distinguishing between a game's difficulty and faults in its design. With these goals in mind, we can work together to make the gaming community more welcoming to newcomers, more accessible to those with disabilities, and more fun for everyone. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this essay. I'm curious to hear how you feel about the topic, so please let me know in the comments down below. As I've stated many times, difficulty is pretty subjective, so hearing everyone's opinions may even change my own to a degree. With that said, be sure to be on the lookout for future videos, subscribe and tickle the bell to be notified when they come out, and as always, have a mighty nifty day today.